no one has written more extensively, more deeply, and more insightfully about uh, freedom and determinism than perhaps Ted Heinrich. Um, his legacy and his influence in this area looms very large, and I have a particular debt uh, to his view. And we'll see today that my view, uh, in many ways, is a natural, I think, progression or, or uh, maybe from his perspective, the bastard stepchild of his own views on these issues. We'll see. Um, and I, I will hope to focus on three main aspects of Ted's work. Um, in particular, his defense of determinism um, and its consequences for origination and moral responsibility. Um, particularly the second part I'll spend most of my time on, which is his concern for the, um, the, in, the consequences of the truth of determinism for, say, our life hopes. And I did want to say a lot about uh, justi uh, the justification for punishment, but I don't think I'll get there. Um, he has a great book on punishment um, that I, I highly recommend, and my own views on punishment were influenced by that book. Um, and I have my own particular non-retributive account of punishment I wish I could present today, but uh, it'll have to wait for another time. Um, so Ted's work um, and, his, and his defense of determinism are pretty well known. He has that extensive handout um, that hopefully you received. So I don't want to spend a lot of time laying out what the thesis is, and I want to spend more time on talking about its consequences and its implications. Um, but Heinrich defends, Ted defends the thesis of determinism, which maintains that ordinary causation is true of all events, and that in our choosing and our deciding, we're subject to causal laws. Um, this amounts to the claim that all of our mental events, including our choices, decisions, actions, <coughs> Uh, are effects of causal sequences or chains of causal sequences um, such that they have to happen or are necessitated and can't be owed to what he calls origination. Um, he often frames this, and maybe more in his recent work, in terms of causalism and explanationism, uh, which amounts to the claim that every event has a causal explanation. And he says if we're all good empiricists, we should accept the thesis of determinism. In fact, uh, no proposition has more inductive support, he says, than the thesis of determinism. Um, I won't say much, uh, uh, I'll just say a couple quick things about his criticisms of quantum mechanics. Um, it, it won't be the focus of my comments today, but he believes that quantum mechanics hasn't uh, refuted determinism, far from it. Um, he says there's no direct and unequivocal experimental evidence of quantum mechanics, and that the standard interpretation of quantum mechanics is a quote, quote, quote unquote, logical mess and contains contradiction in it. Um, I take it that he thinks that whatever they're up to, they're not up to addressing the uh, events. And the thesis of determinism for Ted applies only to events. And part of his criticisms, I think, of quantum mechanics is that they are not talking about indeterminacy of events. But I'll leave that to him to clarify later. Um, OK, so with that behind, um, I want to focus primarily on the consequences of determinism for our lives, and uh, I particularly focus initially on uh, what it means for what he calls origination and moral responsibility, and then focus a little bit in a moment on life hopes. Um, he first says that both compatibilism and incompatibilism fail to adequately deal with the truth of determinism, and that's because they both are sharing the false assumption that there's only one conception of free will. He believes that there are two conceptions of free will, free will as voluntariness and free will as origination. The former is compatible with the truth of determinism, the latter is not compatible with the truth of determinism. Um, however, he acknowledges that the truth of determinism and the loss of origination, the kind of free will that's inconsistent <laughs> with the truth of determinism, uh, creates concerns for our standing as human beings and for our life hopes. Um, and in an attempt to preserve some of what's lost when we give up the idea of origination um, and the responsibility attached to that conception of free will, Ted introduces his grand hope for humanity, which involves abandoning the politics of desert and embracing the principle of uh, humanity. And in his more recent book, um, which has been discussed today on actualism, he believes that his account of uh, consciousness can also perhaps uh, 
uh, preserve some of what is lost when we lose the conception of origination and uh, moral responsibility. Okay, so I will first say a few things about how my view uh, differs and how it's similar to Ted's view. Um, and I don't know how much daylight there is between our views, so I'll let him um, clarify that. I don't have direct objections as much as I do laying out a kind of comparison between our two different perspectives. So I am what you call a free will skeptic. A free will skeptic maintains that who we are and what we do is ultimately the result of factors beyond our control. And because of this, we lack um, what's called basic dessert moral responsibility, the kind of dessert that would be necessary for us to truly deserve praise and blame, reward and punishment. Um, in the past, the standard argument for this type of skepticism was what's called hard determinism, which was the claim that determinism is true and inconsistent or incompatible with free will and basic dessert moral responsibility. And that's either because determinism is incompatible with the ability to do otherwise, which is called leeway incompatibilism, or determinism is incompatible with the agent being the uh, ultimate source of their actions, which is sometimes called source incompatibilism. Um, hard determinism had its heyday during the time when Newtonian physics reigned, and it it doesn't have many defenders today, and that's largely because despite the efforts of Ted, um, many people have taken the interpretation, the standard interpretation of quantum mechanics to either either throw in doubt or shed some uh, um, question about the thesis of determinism as a universal claim about all events. Um, that's not to say that quantum mechanics has falsified determinism, because it hasn't. There are still defenders of determinism. Ted's a great example. Um, and even if there's some indeterminism at the micro level of our existence, the level studied by quantum mechanics, there's still likely what Ted calls determinism where it matters, or near determinism. That is, at the level of choice and action, and even the neural events associated with those, determinism would still hold. So even if we allowed some indeterminism at the micro level, there would still likely be what Ted calls near determinism. Nonetheless, most contemporary free will skeptics are agnostic about the truth of determinism, and my view falls within this category. I call myself a hard incompatibilist. Um, that's a phrase that was coined by Dirk Piraboom. And basically, it's the claim that uh, free will is incompatible with both determinism and indeterminism. Um, so it's a view that essentially argues both against libertarian accounts of free will and compatibilist accounts of free will. So I'll just lay out quickly a little sketch of what my view maintains here. So against the view that free will is compatible with causal determination of our actions by factors ultimately beyond our control, I argue that there's no relevant difference between that and uh, causal determination by manipulators. So if you think about, um, if you're familiar with the literature, Dirk Piraboom's four case example, or the zygote example. These are arguments about manipulation that say, manipulation from an external agent would be indistinguishable from causal determinism in a natural sense. I further argue though that, it, uh, that causal determinism is incompatible with an agent's ability to do otherwise, which I also think is a necessary condition for free will. So that's a pretty standard view, um, and it would be consistent with the traditional hard determinist line. Um, but since I leave the door open for indeterminism, that is, I'm, I'm agnostic about whether determinism as a universal thesis is true, um, I argue against libertarianism, and there are different brands of libertarianism. Um, one kind just acknowledges indeterminism at the level of events. So against event causal libertarians, I object that on such accounts, agents are left um, basically unable to settle whether a decision occurs and hence can't have the control required for the kind of free will that's at, at stake in the, in the traditional debate, which is the kind that's needed for basic dessert moral responsibility. So the most famous version of event causal libertarianism would be Robert Kane's account. And I don't think it's enough to ground the kind of control and action that would be needed. Um, ultimately, what we end up doing seems somewhat arbitrary on, on this view. 
while aging causal libertarianism could get us the control that's needed to ground basic desert moral responsibility, I argue that it doesn't fit and it's not really, it can't be reconciled with our best physical theories about the world. And I also argue in my book on free will and consciousness that it uh, faces additional problems accounting for mental causation. Um, there's another account I don't mention here, which is non-causal accounts, and I think those accounts also have a problem grounding control, uh, the kind of control that would be needed for basic desert moral responsibility. So given that all the options fail, <laughs> um, I ultimately think that we're left with free will skepticism as the only remaining option. Um, I'm not sure if Ted knows, but I follow his tweet his tweets and his Twitter account, and I saw today that he wondered why I call myself a free will skeptic and not a free will denier. Uh, it's just pop it's, it, it's the phrase that has become popular over time. I am a free will denier. Um, but the free will skeptic view is often associated with a larger class of views, some of which, like me, straight up des deny the existence of free will, and includes those that are sort of um, agnostic about the claim that says, look, if we're going to blame people, we're going to hold them accountable, it causes harm. Blaming, punishing, retributive punishment causes harm. You have to reach a certain kind of epistemic standard to justify that kind of harm. And the argument is that we don't have enough epistemic uh, justification for believing in free will. Those kind of views would also fall under this label of free will skepticism. But if it makes Ted happy, you could call me a denier. <laughs> Uh, okay, so my view is very similar to, I think, uh, Ted's view, except that I'm agnostic about <laughs> determinism. Um, officially, I'm agnostic about determinism. I, I do generally agree with the near enough determinism or determinism where it matters, and maybe in his understanding of determinism, I may uh, uh, committed to the truth of determinism as well. I just um, want to leave the door open as to the ultimate account of physics. And I think either way, there's not going to be enough for the kind of free will that's needed. So I imagine Ted is going to resist a couple things in what I've said so far. For one, I, I have a kind of univocal treatment of free will. He thinks there's two types of free will. And that's why the historical debate has been somewhat muddied, because some people are talking about voluntariness and some people are talking about origination, whereas I'm treating free will as one thing. Um, and he may also, I think he would, shun my label of free will skepticism. Um, so I want to push on this just a little bit to see if I could get Ted to at least agree that the to one form of free will skepticism, and I think it's the form that is most relevant in the traditional debate, in which case maybe I would hope he could adopt a more full-throated free will skepticism. Um, and if I could get him to adopt my optimistic skepticism, that would be great too. So I call myself a free will skeptic. However, I'm also optimistic about the implications of free will skepticism, so I also call myself an optimistic skeptic. Um, so we'll see what that amounts to in a moment. Um, OK, so we just saw that, uh, oh, sorry, let me see, go back here. Um, here's what I take to be what's of central importance in the free will debate. Um, it's basic dessert. I mentioned this a few times now. But what I think is of central philosophical and practical importance in the free will debate is a particular type of control that's needed in action to ground a common but pervasive and I think very important uh, notion of moral responsibility, and it's usually picked out by the notion of basic desert. This would be a purely backwards-looking, non-consequentialist type of moral responsibility. So you could, you could sort of break these views of moral responsibility into two camps, those that look backwards and those that maybe look forwards. Um, backwards-looking accounts hold the individual morally uh, blameworthy, praiseworthy for their actions because they deserve in a basic sense, they deserve to be either punished, rewarded, praised, or blamed for their actions. Um, Dirk Peerboom has a great definition. I share this definition, uh, so I'll read it. For an agent to be morally responsible for an action in this sense is for it to be hers in such a way that she would deserve to be blamed if she understood it was morally wrong, and she would deserve to be praised if she understood that it was morally exemplary. The deserted issue here is basic in the sense that the agent would deserve to be blamed or praised just because she has performed the action, given understanding of its moral status, 
and not, for example, merely by virtue of consequentialist or contractualist situations. Um, I know I'm not going to talk about punishment, but uh, Ted frames the question about punishment in this way as well. If you ask um, what justifies punishment, some people will say because the agent deserves it. That's backwards looking. Uh, retribution. Um, if you say because it will prevent crime, that's forward looking, consequentialist. Okay. Um, so I'm denying essentially a backwards looking account of basic desert moral responsibility. I think that that's the type of moral responsibility that's historically been under dispute in the free will uh, debate. And it's the kind that I take myself to be denying. Um, so understood this way, free will is a kind of power or ability an agent must possess in order to justify certain kinds of desert-based treatments, judgments, and uh, uh, attitudes. And you might include here the retributive uh, forms of punishment, but you might also include what are called the reactive attitudes, um, uh, at least the ones that are generally associated with P.F. Strawson's famous paper. Um, those would be the kinds of judgments, attitudes, and treatments that I think are required for free will, and they're the kinds of judgments, attitudes, and treatments I believe uh, uh, we lack. So, uh, that, sorry, that are unjustified because I think we lack this kind of free will. So this is the kind of free will that's being denied by uh, the free will skeptics like Piraboom, myself, uh, Galen Strawson, Neil Levy, um, and Bruce Waller is a person who, who denies this type of moral responsibility, and I like to include him in our camp of people who are free will skeptics. Um, so I would argue that this is also the kind of free will that's being rejected by Ted. Um, in which case, then, I, do, I think it would be accurate to label him a free will skeptic. So I'll see if he can ag he'll agree with this, maybe or not. Um, so we just saw that um, on Ted's account, um, he's denying that determinism is consistent with what he calls origination. This kind of free will is ruled out by the truth of determinism. It's the idea that an action is owed to a choice or decision that's uncaused and yet within the control of the actor. Um, so he, he, he maintains that that type of free will is inconsistent with determinism, and on his view, determinism is true. So according to Ted, the uh, conception of free will as origination is, quote, the primary ordinary sense, the sense that matters. So he seems to be sharing with me that this is the, the sense that's most important or typically associated with the debate on free will. Furthermore, um, our being free in the origination sense, he says, and hence our being held responsible and credited with responsibility for our actions, not to mention our prospects of heaven, is our being free in a way logically incompatible with determinism. So he seems to also be rejecting the kind of basic desert moral responsibility that I'm rejecting. Uh, and just one more longer quote, he says, it is likely that a free will theory really cannot get rid of the embarrassment of an originator. It has to have something that it's going to, that's, that's going to be responsible. A past decision itself, whether it, it was probable or self-caused or teleological or anything else, isn't what we hold responsible for actions or give a kind of moral credit uh, to for actions. If a philosopher says, um, if a philosopher says it is not a person in an ordinary sense who's responsible, something of a certain traits, desires, and so on, he will indeed need to offer us something more than a choice or a decision in certain relations. We don't put past decisions in jail either. I like that. <laughs> um, so he does seem that, to think that that's the conception of free will that's really at stake when we're talking about moral responsibility, when we're talking about what justifies, say, retributive punishment, what justifies uh, certain types of uh, desert-based claims of uh, praise and blame. Um, and that's the kind of free will that I'm denying. That's the kind of free will that most of us free will skeptics are denying. And I take Ted to also be denying. Um, so given those comments, I maintain that it's legitimate to label Ted a free will skeptic. Um, I don't know if he'll like that label. <laughs> um, so it's, it's the kind of free will that I'm denying, and I think it's the same type of free will that he's denying. Um, while voluntariness is an important concept, it is not the kind of uh, concept for either Ted or myself that is enough to ground basic desert responsibility. 
Um, and since I'm defining free will in terms of basic dessert, basically I'm defining free will as the control in action that's required for basic dessert moral responsibility. Um, I take his view to be denying that type of free will. So since basic dessert moral responsibility is, I contend, what is of central philosophical and practical importance in the historical debate, I think Ted should, uh, Ted should embrace a more full-throated free will skepticism. Just a couple quick things here. Um, he may disagree with that last bullet where I say that this is what is of central philosophical and practical importance. Um, I have argued elsewhere um, a number of reasons for why it's best to define free will in this way, and I'll just mention a few real quick. Um, I think, again, my definition of free will is free will is the kind of control and action that's required for basic dessert moral responsibility. I think that's the, a good definition uh, to adopt for a couple reasons. One is it's a neutral definition that virtually all parties in the free will debate can accept. It's a definition that a compatibilist could accept, a libertarian could accept, and a free will skeptic could accept. Um, we could all agree that this is what we're debating. We're debating whether certain types of judgments, treatments, and attitudes can be morally justified. Second, um, it fits with our folk psychological understanding of the concepts. There's some really good work in what's called X or experimental philosophy that seems to show that beliefs in free will and beliefs in these types of moral responsibility that I'm getting at uh, go up and down together. So when you diminish people's beliefs in free will, it seems you diminish their beliefs in uh, basic desert. In the reverse, people who tend to have higher scores on these scales that measure belief in free will tend to call for more punitive forms of punishment in a number of hypothetical scenarios. So it seems that the folk, the ordinary folk, link the concepts of free will and moral responsibility in this way. Thirdly, um, it captures the practical significance of the debate. I don't know what we're really debating um, if we're debating just some abstract concept of free will that has no practical significance. Um, I don't find the sort of metaphysical dispute to be of any real interest if it doesn't apply or somehow connect to our various attitudes, judgments, and treatments. And so I think to keep it, be, to keep it uh, having practical significance, and I, like Ted, actually, have been very influenced by Ted's focus on the <coughs> practical implications of this debate, I um, think it's very important to keep it tied to practices of having to do with punishment, judgments, attitudes, different forms of treatment that we take uh, towards people. And lastly, um, I think rejecting this understanding of free will makes it really difficult to understand the nature of the substantive dispute um, between compatibilists, incompatibilists. Um, as a free will skeptic, I'm perfectly fine with forward-looking consequentialist justifications for various types of judgments and maybe even various forms of punishment. That can't be what we're debating then, because both sides agree to that. We have to be debating something else, and what I think we're debating is the backwards-looking types of uh, moral desert claims and things like retributivism. Um, otherwise, I'm not sure exactly where our disagreements lie. So, um, okay, so while most origination skeptics, I'm going to use this term now because I don't think Ted wants me to call him a free will skeptic, <laughs> so maybe he'd be okay with calling him an origination skeptic because he denies that we have that type of free will, maybe even a moral responsibility skeptic because in those quotes it seems he's saying we lack that kind of responsibility because it's inconsistent with free will. Um, most of us who hold these types of views are generally um, uh, optimistic about the implications, or at least um, are not fearful of the implications of this view. Um, if you think about Dirk Piraboom, Bruce Waller, Thomas Nettlehofer, myself, um, we generally um, welcome the denial of free will, the death of moral responsibility in the sense I've defined. Ted, however, is authentically dismayed by the implications of determinism. Um, and he thinks that it potentially has the risk of, of uh, restricting our life hopes. Um, but you have to be careful because he has a number of nuanced, different attitudes we take here. Uh, I don't know, hopefully I can do justice to it in the time I have. Um, 
OK, so quickly, according to Ted, life hopes give an individual's life a good deal of its meaning. They tend to have two kinds of content. The first kind of content has to do with the state of affairs we're hoping for. So like any hope, a life hope might be to become a successful philosopher, be a good father, live simply a decent life. Um, but equally, or perhaps more importantly, the other content of a hope has to do with future actions. Maybe even a long, he says, campaign of future actions. So, um, life hopes are not just about wanting something, they're about our future actions, and it's through our actions that we achieve our life hopes. Um, the problem, however, seems to be that determinism is incompatible, he says, with a particular type of life hope. Um, so we have a kind of life hope that seems incompatible with the belief in determinism. The kind of life hope invokes thinking of our future as open or unfixed um, or alterable. And here's a quote, he says, if I have a hope of this kind, I take it that questions about my future are not yet answered. It's not that the answers are already settled and stored up, but they do not yet exist. I've got a chance, it's up to me, maybe I can succeed, that kind of life hope. Um, Life hopes understood in this way require free will, require origination, uh, since they require that the future is open and my nature and environment is overcomable. Um, so here's a nice long quote. Suppose you become convinced of the truth of our theory of determinism. Becoming really convinced will not be easy for several reasons, but it's not, uh, but sorry, but try not to, but try not to imagine a day uh, when we do come to believe determinism fully. Also imagine bringing your new belief together with a life hope of the kind we've been considering, this natural way of contemplating your future. What would be the upshot? It would almost certainly be dismay. Your response to determinism in connection with uh, the hope would be dismay. If you really were persuaded of determinism, the hope would collapse. This is because such a hope had a necessary part or a condition of which the rest of it depends. That is the image of origination. There could be no such hope if all the future is just effects of effects of effects, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Um, it's for this reason, I think, that many people have found determinism to be a black thing. John Stuart Mill felt it as an incubus. And to speak for myself, it has certainly got me down in the past. So. Okay, so dismay. <laughs> um, um, I'll try to be quick. Um, so my view is optimistic about the implications. I don't, I don't share this dismay uh, with Ted. And, uh, and I, I, for a number of reasons, um, I don't know if I could do justice to all of them now, but I maintain that life without free will and basic desert would not be destructive or as destructive as many people believe. In my previous work, I've argued that meaning in life, sustaining good interpersonal relationships, mm -hmm. for example, would not be threatened. With regard to punishment, I think an incapacitation account or rehabilitation programs could be justified. And in particular with the life hopes, um, I wanted to make an analogy with creativity because I do think in both the way Ted is talking about life hopes and what I think of as uh, creative enterprises that agents engage in. We want some kind of creative agency. That is, we have a desire, we have a hope that we want to achieve, and it's through creative agency that we're capable of achieving that end. Um, however, I, I'm going to skip a little bit of this, and let me just put up one thing here. Um, I wanted to use this example with Einstein, because we just celebrated the, hun the hundredth anniversary of Einstein's theory of uh, new theory of gravity, uh, relativity. And in the papers, you, you, you get some quotes. I'll just read one quote that I found here that was in a paper. Einstein's achievement requires perseverance and enormous creativity as he struggled over a rough and windy road for eight years to formulate the theory. Some people might think, on my view, we couldn't preserve concepts like achievement or uh, enormous creativity or perseverance. But I think those would be misnomers as to what my view maintains. I think achievement here could be preserved rather easily because um, how I'm defining achievement is basically effortful fulfillment of one's goals, desires, hopes. Um, the free will skeptic doesn't deny that we can make efforts. And it doesn't deny that when we achieve the efforts we hope for, that that's not a substantial conception of achievement. Um, so I think we could preserve things like achievement. 
I think we could also preserve concepts like perseverance and creativity. That's because you have to um, differentiate between different types of moral responsibility. There's attributability responsibility, which means I could attribute things to an agent. That is totally consistent with the denial of free will, totally consistent with determinism, totally consistent with free will skepticism. So I could attribute creativity to Einstein. I could attribute um, perseverance. As long as these are character traits that are reflective of the individual, the individual endorses perhaps, you might include some compatibilist kind of conditions here. Um, we could easily attribute perseverance creativity to Einstein without attributing praiseworthiness, um, without bringing in basic dessert. And the same for the concept of achievement. Achievement for me is just effortful, effortful uh, pursuit and fulfillment of one's goals, hopes, etc. cetera. Um, so I know I'm running out of time. I guess I will end there. I did want to say a few things about um, <coughs> character. Let me just, one quick thing, if I can, about moral character, because I'll end on this. If you think about how we develop a moral character, um, it's often a byproduct of how we were raised. And we often um, acknowledge that perhaps I have the moral character I do because of the skill and love of my parents. That doesn't bring dismay to me, to recognize that fact. I don't feel dismay at that. Um, and if anything, I'm grateful for that type of experience. And I think that you could say the same type of thing for Einstein. Einstein actually didn't believe in free will. He also accepted the thesis of determinism. And in a very interesting interview from 1927, he says uh, that he deserved no credit for his career and his achievements. But he didn't feel dismay at that experience either. So I think people could quite often come to realize that they are the circumstances and byproducts of the conditions, their, their environment, often factors of luck, how they were raised, and not feel dismay at their achievements, their accomplishments, and even uh, be able to attribute things like perseverance, creativity, etc. Thank you, Ted. Yeah. It's annoying that American philosophers turn out to be respectably clever, but there it is, they are. And they've got lots of ideas, which are hard to hold on to and catch on to. And I can't really begin to make a satisfactory reply. Maybe I'll write something. That'll fix you. <laughs> um, but let me make just some comments on your principal lines of thought, or several of them. Um, you are much concerned with the question of whether determinism is true and what attitude, roughly speaking, to take to that question. And I am sure that you uh, are touched significantly by the interpretations of quantum mechanics, which appear to um, suggest that there are events which are without explanations. You mustn't slide past the fact that it's a very radical view. There are events, there are things that happen which have no explanations. There's no answer to the question, why did this happen? It's not the case that God knows. No one knows, there is no answer. Now, I must admit, that I think there is some deep reason for resisting that attitude. Um, I find it easier because um, I have a philosopher's attitude to science, to speak a little loosely. I think philosophy isn't deep and it's not clever. It is fundamentally a certain concentration, a greater concentration than science on what you can call the logic of ordinary intelligence. And that isn't uh, certainly not formal logic. It is a logic which is first of all clarity, clarity usually by way of analysis. Secondly, consistency and validity. And thirdly, 
generalness and fourthly completeness. That's what philosophy is, a greater concentration on that stuff than you find within science. That isn't to say it's superior, isn't to say it's superior, but uh, it's pretty easy to have a certain confidence if you're a practitioner of the thing. I noticed that Noam Chomsky mentioned in passing a name that perhaps some of you didn't catch. The name was Benjamin Libet. He was a neuroscientist of some acclaim. And um, he attended to the brain and the mind, and he discovered in his own words that the brain was ahead of the mind. That is, there are brain events and there are conscious events, and there are brain events that explain the conscious events, and the brain is running things. And then some nasty Californian, I think probably a Presbyterian or a Pentecostal or something like that, said that that entailed there wasn't free will. And Benjamin Libet got upset and he did some more research in his neuroscience. And by God, he discovered that the mind is ahead of the brain. Well, it didn't fill me with confidence for neuroscience. No, no, that's a mistake, but there it is. I haven't got the confidence, and I do have a reliance on the logic of ordinary intelligence, and as a result of that, I am inclined to believe in determinism. To come on to um, the principal question that you have been concerned with amongst the many, you can be unhappy if you believe determinism is true. You can be unhappy because, after all, you're not going to have the kind of dessert that you spoke of, origination dessert. You're not going to have a certain fundamental credit. You're not going to be responsible. You're not going to be blamable. Now, it seems to me obviously true that determinism does come as an affront to us. Cain, the great uh, scholar of determinism and freedom, the editor of the two large books put out by Oxford University Press on the subject, says that why people are reluctant, he doesn't quite say this because he's a kind of free willer himself, why people are reluctant to believe in determinism is that it deprives them of standing. It deprives them of standing. After all, they're reduced to the level of um, ordinary mechanisms and so on. It seems to me possible, and here I take the opportunity of departing from the subject of this particular session and reverting to consciousness and bringing consciousness together with free will. I think it is true that in losing free will, that is use it, losing origination desert, one does feel a threat to one's standing. Now, standing is a kind of odd psychological thing, or it's an odd thing for the inquiry of rather good psychologists. But I do actually try something on to you. The actualism theory of consciousness involves the existence of subjective physical worlds. And they are realities. They are out there in space and time. They share some properties with the objective physical world. And they have a dependence not only on the objective physical world, but on you as a perceiver, on you neurally as perceiver. So you are, if you like, a petty demigod, a petty demigod there's something that depends only on you, and it's a matter of tremendous importance to you. It's one of the series of things in which you live your life. It does seem to me possible, I don't know how serious this thought is, but it does seem to me possible that we can escape the dismay of losing free will by seeing that we are not very petty demigods but let me leave that and um, return just for a moment to Greg's views. I'm a little bit 
short on an understanding of what your principal assertion is with respect to our freedom. What freedom do we have and what freedom don't we have? We lack the kind of free will that required for basic dessert. That's the kind of free will I think that's under dispute in the historic debate. Why are you a skeptic then about anything? You're not, you're apparently, a, you're, you're, apparently a, you're apparently an honest determinist. The term, unfortunately, is a term that's gained, gained credence in the U.S. I don't know if it's made its way <laughs> over, the, over here, but right. it's the term that has been, that has taken the label for Dirk Pirogum's view, my view, Bruce right. Waller to some extent, Neil Levy, and it includes some people who are deniers and some who just say we don't have enough epistemic justification to ground these type of practices. Right. So those people are not pure deniers, but they deny that right. we have enough justification to ground, say, retributivism, the reactive attitude. So I think perhaps you're more rational than I am in that matter. Uh -huh. But this, is, this establishes that philosophy is a matter of, so to speak, concentration on the logic of ordinary intelligence and is not a matter of proof. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Thank you for everything.